Today is going to be a good day, guys. You know why? Because we get to build a PC. In front of me, I have all of the parts to build a high performance, low frills gaming PC. I got my Ryzen 7 processor. I've got my B650 motherboard, RAM, uh, storage, and RX 7900 XTX. Yes, we're building one heck of a performance-based system today. It's been a while, but I'm happy I'm gonna be building something on a brand new AMD platform. So let's get right into it. Hello and welcome. My name is Wolfie and you, you're watching Greater Than Pi. And thank you for clicking on this video today. If this is your first one, Congratulations, you found an obscure little corner of the tech internet. And if it's not your first video and you're not subscribed, welcome back. I hope this video convinces you to get subscribed. And of course, if you are subscribed, I appreciate you. Yes, you. Thank you so much for watching my videos. So today, we're gonna be building a compact, high performance gaming PC, all inside the D31 by Johnsbow. Now this case is a high airflow, high feature focused case that actually comes in at a reasonable price. We're gonna be building an AM5 system, of course, and thanks to you guys, we are gonna be going with MATX. Now the Johnsbow can only fit MATX and ITX, but there was a question whether or not we were gonna actually use this case because motherboard choices for AM5 are a little weird. So we went with pretty much the best option that comes in MATX, which is this uh, MSI Mag Mortar B650 Wi-Fi edition. The only other motherboard like in this range was a uh, Gigabyte one that actually had some pretty bad reviews about coil line. That's where this one had generally favorable reviews. For our processor, we've got a Ryzen 7 uh, 7700X. And the reason we went with this is because this PC will be capturing things for Virtual Wolfie, which means it will need just a little bit of extra processing oomph that the x 3 processors will actually struggle with. And of course, for RAM, we got my absolute favorites, Trident Zs. These are Trident Z5 RGBs, and these are actually important for AM5 because they actually have a cast latency of only 32, which is actually really high for DDR5. And their mega transfer speed is 64,000 mega transfers. Storage though, these are a little special. PCIe 4.0, two terabytes each, Samsung, 980 pros and uh these also had a really good sale on them a lot of this stuff ended up being pretty affordable so let's uh let's start by uh, getting our motherboard prepped and ready and i mean this is the first time i'm building an am5 system okay so we got our motherboard inside the box uh, we got some stickers our wi-fi stuff sata connectors and these the m.2 locks two of them and oh they got lucky stickers this time msi why weren't those with the GPU? Those are adorable. <laughs> I'll put them back in the box for now. And I'm not gonna need the SATA connectors either. Useful features of this board do include these easy disconnect M.2 slots. Um, it's actually a reinforced motherboard and it's got these like screws that are used to hold in some of the support pieces, but also prevent you from scratching the back of your motherboard when you are uh, installing things. It's got a built-in IO shield, pretty decent IO, two NVMe, M.2 slots. And then we have a 12 plus four VRM configuration. For outward expansion, we've got USB-C and a USB 3.0. And then also a couple of USB 2.0s along the bottom here. It really is a low frills kind of motherboard, but what it does have is plenty of support for high-end CPUs, which is exactly what we need it for. So if you look actually over here, AMD marked to the triangle in which you line everything up a little bit better this generation. Love to see that. Now, unlike AM4, this is an LGA style instead of a PGA style. Golden triangles right there, golden triangles right here. And we're just gonna, and just like that, all of the keys line up and notch in. And then, there we go. That pops out with a lot more force. Oh man, it's been a very, very long time since I've used anything LGA. <laughs> that was a lot more force than I thought it would be. I do know that for RMA purposes, I do need to save this cover. So we're gonna just set that aside. So our M.2 SSDs are gonna go right in here. And this actually has a smaller screw. Yeah, 
than most of the other things. Now, something I noticed is that these are two different length screws. One is to mount to the top of the actual NVMe socket, and the other one is to lock to the, um, the little screw head over here. And then this has that easy lock system built in. To think that this right here is two terabytes. That's just crazy, you know? I remember when two terabytes was like insane, and the way that you got two terabytes was like a big old spinning drive. Now, now we just load them up into the motherboard like this and you don't even have to connect anything else. That easy connect is nice. And then that just is gonna slot itself in. Now for the most part, if I'm not mistaken, on this platform, it doesn't matter which one of these is the boot drive because either one's going to be ripping fast. The manual for this was actually kind of wrong. I uh, looked at it to make sure that my NVMe SSDs were gonna work. And it said that these were M key in the manual. Now, this is obviously not an M key part because for one, it's facing the wrong direction to be M key. And the other reason is that the N key fits. Oh, I made a mistake though already. Just realized it. We wanna make sure that we take off this thermal pad protector. Something else I appreciate that MSI did was they, it's part of the design, but they labeled each of these heat spreaders one and two. And then because they're labeled one and two, they are also the direction that the numbers work. All right, now comes the fun part. What I am to think right now, we've got most of a system just sitting right here on the table. This dim kit's pretty. Like it really is a nice looking dim kit. The correct ones are gonna be these two right here. And we are in. Okay. Now, CPU cooling. Oh, we've got something special today for the CPU cooler. We've got the Noctua NHD 15, Chrome Max Edition. Old school cooler, but why we have something special for it. Noctua actually was the tipping point in why we were going with air cooling, because they released this. This is the AM5 adjustment bracket for Noctua coolers. So, we installed the normal AM4 one, and then we installed this adjustment bracket, and then this cooler can actually lower it by up to five degrees, which is insane. Okay, there we go. So we should be both in the negative seven millimeters. Let's kind of just test to make sure that we're gonna fit on it here properly. Take off our fans. Oh yeah, we are perfect. Okay, and that looks beautiful. All right, let's goop her up. I used to do just the dot method. I mean, I actually found that the X ended up working better than I do the X. Gonna alternate these till we're tightened down. Look at that nice even mounting pressure. Perfect. All right, now let's see how our fans are gonna work out here. No problem, how high can I go here? We'll see if that fits like that or if we're gonna have to run her in the uh, smaller configuration, but that that is a mother bullet. And she's looking pretty decked out and ready to go. Let's just plug these in over here where we have our system fan and CPU fan. And just like that, I close on underneath there. And voila, we've got most of a computer. So now let's prep the case and get this ready to be put inside. Okay, let's prep this case up for this. So we're gonna actually wanna get our power supply, our fans, and our fan controller all hooked up before we even install the motherboard, which is not the normal order of operations. We also have to get this front panel wired and ready to go as well. For our power supply, we're gonna need this shroud thing right here. And since we're using an air cooler, we can actually move this to the maximum height position. Now, my choice here for how we're going to have the fans run is I'm going to do a negative pressure setup because this case, well, it has lots of room down here and some room over here. 
it looks like it will benefit from actually having all of its air just pulled out and vacuum pressure pulling everything in. And to achieve that, I've got some Noctua Chromax fans, which will be quiet and efficient at doing this. And I'm actually going to do, because you can do 140s at the top. I'm going to do 140s at the top and a 120 in the back. So this whole thing should be really, really quiet. So our Chromax fans are nice and installed. Our fan controller is this uh, one from Deepcool. It looks really nice. It was a good price and it controls up to 10 individual fans. Our PSU today, and this big boy, 1000 GT Supernova by EVGA. Sad that it seems like they're probably going out of business, but this PSU is awesome. It's got individual PCIe leads. It's got a PSU jumper in here for liquid cooling purposes. 1000 watts of pure PSU power, fully modular. And look at these connectors right over here. Oh yeah, also eco mode on and off. But look at this, All right? We've got one, two, three, four SATA, an extra peripheral port, video card, one, two, three, four, five, two CPU and two motherboards. Like all around awesome, awesome power supply. And what we're gonna need, first and foremost, this is into the case. We're gonna wanna pull from in the case since we're using the screen, like so. I mean, look at how beautifully that fits. Oh, that's heavy. Oh gosh, there we go. Starting to get heavy, the system. It might actually be easier standing up, letting gravity do its job. Oh, and actually, before we get her screwed in. Now, this is kind of useful. You could get to the switch if you needed to. In this case, it's got just enough room that if you absolutely needed to, you could get back there. Okay, now with our PSU installed and our fans installed, we can run our cables to where they need to be. Run them behind the motherboard tray. So I'm gonna run my CPU headers up to the top right now before I get my motherboard in, because it's gonna be tight. I have learned my lesson many of times that that connector freaking sucks. It's about as good as we're gonna be able to get that for right now. Now let's set up the screen. This little guy right here uses a USB-C connector and a micro HDMI to HDMI connector. I think the best way to run this is gonna be through here, this little hole right there. All right, everything is hooked up ready for our motherboard. Fortunately for us, our motherboard has a built-in IO shield. So we're just gonna lower it down slowly, like so. Making sure to line it up like that. And with that, we are locked. Now, here's the real test. I don't think I can keep this fan on. <laughs> That's okay. I've run this CPU cooler without this fan more often than not. But shorter memory modules, maybe. But with this one, not so much. There we go. There's actually more room than I thought there would be. Surprisingly? I mean, I, nothing should really surprise me about this case. Like, it fits everything. Credit where credit's due. Johnsbo, you did a really good job of building up a case that is actually enjoyable to work in at its size. All right, that definitely took a bit of work to get to. But we are here and we're ready for the GPU. But on my build area just gets progressively worse and worse. So we are not gonna be able to use the GPU support bracket. That is some tight tolerances though. Oh boy. With our CPU mounted lower because of the, because of the offset mount puts us really close to the bottom here. But that means that we will not be able to use this. No, I don't think so. What's pretty crazy about this whole setup right here is this is like a very performance focused PC. And then we just kind of cable manage this over to here. That's beautiful. Gives plenty of room to breathe. It's getting direct air anyway. Look at that. Oh my goodness. It's a clean looking case. Very dense, but man, is this going to be a powerful system. I'm excited to benchmark it, test it, play games on it. All right, let's give her a boot and see how she do. All right, time for the moment of truth. I feel air moving. Let's see, what do we look like? We've got one fan moving. That one got unplugged. Gosh darn it, that one got unplugged. 
That was still plugged in. Okay, it looks like it's working. I'm gonna have to go back in there and fix some fans. But you're seeing power on the screen, at least. Can't tell. Not seeing anything. It sounds like it's running through typical post stuff. Try a different port. No, nope. keyboard's lit. Okay. Uh, it's BIOS. Okay, we've posted, and now I'm just gonna go ahead and get Windows on it. See if I can get the screen working, and of course, uh, fix up these fans that got disconnected, unfortunately. So uh, yeah, let's do that, and then we'll cut back to it with some numbers. The PC has been done for a little bit now and I've actually put a lot of hours into using it because well, it's a pretty awesome gaming PC. It's compact, which is great for my desk real estate, but more importantly, it is very performance focused. By having AMD's best gaming GPU, by having a really good AMD processor, having 100% solid state storage and really fast RAM, this system just works. And the gaming experience is actually pretty awesome. It's very smooth, really fast load times, and I just love it. Now we did change some parts in the build because I wanted to test some things out. For one, I actually changed out the cooler to this really cool one that's got a temperature readout on it from Deep Cool. And we'll have a video about that actually really soon, but you can see a little bit of it in the B-roll. And we also added an external sound card, which is also a video that we're gonna be doing soon. Now, we did not need to add the external sound card and we didn't need to change the air cooler, but at the same time, there are some changes that I made while I put in hundreds of hours into Starfield. Speaking of Starfield, let's talk about performance on this PC. So, Starfield is the newest game in our test suite and it is an interesting one because it actually is both CPU and GPU dependent, which makes it a great game to actually benchmark a gaming PC. And well, let's just say things got interesting here. We got 118 frames per second on average as reported by the AMD Radeon software. But in places like New Atlantis or in Aquila City, that frame rate can drop as low as 60 frames per second. And after a particularly long session in which the creative engine actually builds up a frame buffer that sits in the memory, it could drop as low as 50 frames per second. So our lows are kind of drastic, but our frame pacing is actually really good. And this is also being run on a 21 by nine ultra wide monitor, which has a few extra pixels to actually drive to make this work. The CPU actually did sit around 83 degrees in the more populated areas, which isn't comfortable for a CPU while gaming, but it did hold out just fine. Forza Horizon 5 is a pretty graphically demanding game that actually doesn't benefit from AMD nearly as much as it does from Nvidia, even though AMD is, I think, one of the major sponsors of the game. That being said, we still hit 159 frames per second on the absolute maximum settings in ultra wide, which is more than playable at that resolution and at our targeted frames per second of 144. Tiny Tina's Wonderland was 142 frames per second. And again, that is at ultra wide. And we did not use the bad A setting because even the game dissuades you from doing that. Unfortunately, there's a bug or maybe even as a feature that automatically disables it between restarts of the game. So you're never really running it consistently, which I find very interesting. Overall, this PC actually is perfectly balanced for the setup that it's in. And when adding in the fact that I've synced everything to Razer Chroma again, this system just works coherently. The RGB, 
is synced. The, the actual performance is balanced. And while this would probably be a very, very expensive PC to build all at once, it is definitely a very expensive PC. I did not even really think about the cost of the parts as I was buying them. So while this is a very expensive PC, I do actually find it a very interesting experience as a PC builder. While it seems pretty normal, it's actually pretty interesting to build something of this caliber and of this type, but there are gonna be some changes. For one, I do not think I have the best airflow configuration for this build. I really think that a 360 millimeter AIO firing towards the top, so pulling all the air through, would be the best airflow configuration for this kind of PC. Problem is, I would want to do one that I've never done before. I really wanna do one with a screen on it because I've literally never taken a look at them but those are very expensive. And at the time, this was already an expensive build, but I think that will be the next component that I switch out on it. I really like the build quality of the John Smoke case, and it just came out pretty good. And I'm looking forward to seeing more cases in this form factor, which I know there's one from Antec actually coming real soon that actually has a temperature sensor built right into it and is using the exact same bones. So it's probably being manufactured by the exact same people. I like it and it came out well. Now I am excited for my next build, which will actually be my editing workstation PC. And with the new Threadripper coming out, we'll see if that is in the cards. It may not be because that is going to be very expensive, but that build is going to be high core count not necessarily heavy GPU power, but definitely a lot of RAM and a lot of storage. So it's gonna be a little bit different than any of the gaming PCs I've actually built on the channel before. So if you're not subscribed, get subscribed to check that one out when it comes out. I appreciate you so much for checking out our video today, and I would love to see you in the next video. Wolfie, out.